Good morning. Um, welcome to those who are here in person and those who are watching online. We're glad that you're here on this uh, Sunday. We hope that you recognized as you came in, if you're here in person, the hard work that so many did yesterday. We had such a great crowd. I think we had around uh, 17 adults and around nine kids and everyone lent a hand. And so we just encourage you even following worship just to go take a look, especially outside. We had diligent um, gardeners outside. So thanks to the property team for organizing the day and for all those who made it such a success. Uh, there is a congregational meeting following, so um, we hope that you're able to stay for a few moments following worship. And if you're following online, um, there's a Zoom link. If you didn't get it, uh, you can email me and I'll send it out to you, but that will happen directly following worship, so we hope that you're able to stay. Uh, Grow Women uh, finished on Wednesday. I wondered if they were going to, as Allison said, they wanted to stay and catch up. Um, the Grow Men, we still have three more sessions together, so if you would like to join us, uh, you're welcome to do that. Just a reminder that dishes, um, if you've done angel food or helped out with some kind of food in the last little bit, uh, there's dishes there on the table um, or on the foyer. So please um, pick those up uh, if you remember. There's something else that you said. Oh, uh, and then just one kind of small, well, maybe not so small, um, another um, thing that we would like to do here at the church, we'd like to get the garden going again. So if you're interested in helping Allison get that organized, just a reminder that um, that became kind of a wonderful outreach for us as we delivered fresh vegetables to people. It often supplemented uh, what we received from um, Clearwater Farms. So if, uh, if you'd like to help Allison with that, if you could just uh, speak with her this morning. So again, welcome. Just uh, let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Let's stand as we sing together. You were the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful
before you this morning, our Lord Jesus, as we enter into your presence at your gracious invitation. Here we come to celebrate you. 
Here we come to acknowledge your holiness, proclaim your greatness, be humbled in your presence, to confess our sins, to seek your forgiveness, and to know the generosity of your love. What an honor it is to set our hearts and our faces toward you. And so we pray in the words that Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Please be seated. So uh, Riley's gonna put up a picture here for us and uh, and can you tell me what this is? I got my mom to send it yesterday. Can you tell me what that is? It's scraps of material. A present. No, it's not a present. It, well, you, it kind of looks like it could be bows or something. You're right, it could be. What it is is it's scraps of material. That's what it is. Um, we call this, if, you're, uh, if you sew or those kinds of things, you call it remnants right, kind of leftover pieces. Now, I always thought, what can my mom, because my mom can turn something into something beautiful often. So she can take um, food that days old and she seems to be able to do something with it. And so she, she takes these remnants, they're called, all these pieces of scrap that I think most people would throw away, and then I just want to show you what she does with it. Now, she turns that into a pillow. She takes remnants, all these pieces of scrap that most people would throw away, and she turns it into something beautiful. Hmm. It's like taking 12 brothers in the Old Testament and turning them into a nation. It's like taking a bunch of people with all their foibles and all their things that they don't do right and they put them all together somehow and we become a church led by two imperfect people with their own foibles and their own struggles. And together, you take all these things, all these scraps, all these people together and you put them together and they make something beautiful. Something beautiful. I need you to remember that this morning, okay? So let's, uh, let's pray before you go off to grow kids. Um, and can you guys pray after me? Can we say, thank you, God, that you love us, that together we are your church. Thank you that we are beautiful in your sight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. So the kids can head out. And as the kids head out... Sang this great old hymn, a uh, great old worship song, uh, a few weeks ago. And it's just a good reminder as we're going through all of scripture, looking for Jesus, that uh, these are the days. Yeah. 
The reading today is from Isaiah 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by the, from your birth, carried from the womb. To whom will you liken me? and make me equal, and compare me as though we were alike. Those who are stolen from the purse, and weigh a silver in the scales, they hire a goldsmith who makes it into gold. Then they fall down and break. They lift it to their shoulders, they carry it, they set it in its place, and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries out to it, it does not answer or save anyone from trouble. Remember this and consider it. Recall it to mind and Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man for my purpose from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have planned, and I will do it. I bring near my deliverance. It is not far off, and my salvation will not tarry. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. This is the word of the Lord. Our scripture lesson this morning is coming um, from Zephaniah. We're looking at the prophet Zephaniah today. Zephaniah chapter 3, if you have your Bible with you. And I want to encourage you, if you're coming, to either bring your Bible with you or we'll, I think we'll put the Bibles back out again so you can pick one up on your way in 
And you can follow along as we read. Zephaniah 3, starting with the first verse. This is God's word for us today. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are unprincipled. They are treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no wrong. Morning by morning he dispenses his justice and every new day he does not fail. Yet the unrighteous know no shame. I have destroyed nations, their strongholds demolished. I have left their streets deserted with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste, they are deserted and empty. Of Jerusalem I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her but they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour out my wrath on them, all my fierce anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, Jerusalem, you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty, on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is God's word for us this morning. Thanks be to him. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sometimes reading the Bible is like being a detective. You're looking for clues. If you are not a history buff, like I am not a history buff, the long list of the names of the kings of Israel and Judah might be little more than a list of names of the kings of Judah and Israel that we cannot pronounce 
And so we just kind of skip over them to get to the more interesting stories, the meatier stories, the better stories. But if you read closely, if you read carefully, you will find clues that help bring out the richer meaning of the story. And that is the case today with the prophet Zephaniah. I mean absolutely no disrespect when I say this, but we are now reading our 14th prophetic book in very quick succession. It's sort of the prophet of the week. And so it's easy to feel a bit lost or overwhelmed or maybe even underwhelmed. Same story, different name. Often it seems that we treat the prophets as that, the prophets, as a kind of collective voice of puzzling and strange writings, many of them set as poems written by eccentrics who live outside the mainstream on the margins, spoken through kind of a megaphone to people who weren't listening. Fourteen books so far, all kind of flowing together, announcing bad news, written in riddles. The prophets just seem to kind of all blend together in a big soup of confusion, misunderstanding, and misinterpretation. It's Babylon and Assyria, it's Judah and Israel, the people have sinned, the people have turned to idols, destruction is coming, repent for destruction is at hand, yada, 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 and it all kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And so to prevent this from happening, to enable each prophet to be heard, and more importantly, to listen to what God is saying through each of the prophets, we need to attune our ears not for what is the same, because there is a lot of the same. And we would tend to just tune it out. I've heard this before. But we need to tune our ears to what is different. What new thing is God saying? Was God saying then? And is God saying now to us today? So let me introduce you to Zephaniah, one of the lesser-known, low-profile prophets. And I'm going to admit that when I started reading the book of Zephaniah, I pretty much skipped over verse 1. Because I know that the word of God came to Zephaniah the prophet. That's why his book is included. It's the name of the book. But I skipped over the rest of the verse. The son of, the son of, during the reign of. But in doing so, I missed the important clues that would help me to understand what it was that God wanted to say through Zephaniah. Lesson learned. Don't be like Allison. Read the first verse. So the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cush, and then the others of his family line are mentioned. But here's the clue that helps us understand Zephaniah's context. He served during the reign of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Ammon was the son of Manasseh, one of the worst kings in the history of all of Judah. Uh, and during Manasseh's kingship, he not only permitted but he encouraged the worship of false gods, even going so far as to allow and encourage that altars to the false gods be built within God's temple in Jerusalem. And Manasseh himself was no passive kind of onlooker, just giving 
allowance to this, but he was an active participant in the worship of false gods. He practiced sorcery and consulted with the mediums. And when Manasseh died, his son Amon, aged 22, became king. And about Amon's kingship, we read in 2 Kings 21, where it says, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. The son continued in the same pattern as his father. Thankfully, um, Amon's reign lasted only two years, and he was assassinated by his own palace officials. But in 2 Kings, it continues to say that he walked in the ways of his father. He worshipped the idols his father had worshipped, and he bowed down to them. He forsook the Lord, the God of his fathers, and he did not walk in the ways of the Lord, like father, like son. When Amon died, his eight-year-old son, Josiah, became king, the eight-year-old king. And it is written of Josiah that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This little eight-year-old boy turned the kingship around. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Of Josiah, it is written that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked all in all of the ways of his father, David. His father, David? David was not his father. David was not his biological father. But he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of his father, his kingship mentor father, David, and he was a good king. Under Josiah's reign, the temple was restored to God, and only God was worshipped. And while the renovations were taking place, the renovations to remove all the altars to the false gods that had built, been built inside the temple, when the renovations were taking place, the workmen found a book in the temple. They found the book of the law, the first five books of our Bible. They found it in the temple. It had been missing for all of those years of Manasseh's reign, of Ammon's reign. And now they found it again. And the high priest of the temple sent it to Josiah. And when Josiah, this little boy king, read it, he tore his clothing because he understood how angry God must be about the ways his children had disobeyed him, had abandoned him, and had forgotten him. And so a little child would lead them. And Josiah's 31-year kingship, he was dedicated to restoring Judah to God. But despite his most earnest commitment and efforts to restoring them back to God, the spiritual damage that was done by his father and by his grandfather could not be easily reversed. And though Josiah followed God, his people did not. And they continued in their well-worn ways. So Zephaniah, Zephaniah was called to be a prophet of God during the reign of King Josiah. Another poet prophet. Does anyone else feel like we should be listening to more poets? I do. Zephaniah's message is not the same as all the other prophets because he is not only declaring what God has planned for Judah, giving warning about God's plans for the enemies of his people, but Zephaniah is pointing to something much, much greater, and by greater I don't mean fantastic. I mean greater in scope and scale. These are Zephaniah's opening words. 
The Lord says, I will sweep everything from the face of the earth. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will only have heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Now maybe by this point in reading all the doom and gloom of the prophets, this no longer sounds unusual to our ears, which is unusual in itself. But if you read closely and you remember the context in which these words have been spoken, that I told you that during this time, the book of the law, the first five books of our Old Testament, had just been rediscovered and were being retaught to the people of Judah. It's stories retold in the temple then you might hear these words from Zephaniah's mouth as the prophecy of the undoing of creation, of the creation story. I will sweep everything from the face of the earth, both men and animals, birds of the air and fish of the sea, and cut off man from the face of the earth. Creation in reverse. This isn't just about the sin of Judah. It's not just about the sin of the pagan nations that would come to attack Judah. What Zephaniah sees is much, much bigger. He sees the coming of the day of the Lord, and more specifically, the coming of the wrath and judgment. And of course, They had a long history of hearing these kind of predictions of judgment and wrath. But the predictions of the judgment and wrath that had come before were always specific. They were localized and they were time sensitive. Never before had there been a prophecy about a total destruction a wipeout. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. The whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. The day of the Lord. It's not something we talk about a lot here at Kesbras. You probably don't talk about it a lot with your friends or your family. It's not a part of our everyday vocabulary. In the church, the day of the Lord was something overemphasized, maybe in previous generations, and a fixation of some denominations. And so it was just kind of easy for us to put a little bit of distance between ourselves and that. That which was spoken of with such urgency and fervor, but still hasn't happened, can feel kind of awkward and embarrassing. As if somehow we are embarrassed by God's inaction, the warning, the threat of the coming of the day of the Lord reminds me of the threat of nuclear war. Something that seemed so desperate and so talked about in previous generations, and now we are living in a time when the actual threat of a nuclear war is probably much, much more realistic, and we are hearing about those threats on our news on a daily basis, and yet, Is anybody preparing for a nuclear war? Are we paying attention? Exactly. 
Is it because we believe that it will not happen? Or is it because that we have become so desensitized to hearing the threat, the threat, the threat, the threat, we're no longer paying attention. They no longer register. Outside of the church, the day of the Lord has no meaning. What day? What, what Lord? Our society, our culture, our neighbors, our friends, they're like the society in Judah. And Zephaniah captures their attitude in a proverb that was probably making the rounds in Jerusalem in that time. In chapter 1, verse 12, it says, They think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. In other words, the Lord, what good is the Lord? What's the Lord going to do about it? He does nothing. God does nothing God has nothing to do with our lives or our world. We are completely a secularized culture, mostly unaware and almost completely disconnected from God. As Elizabeth Ochtemeyer states, though a large percentage of North Americans still say they believe in some kind of God, we don't count on him much, aside from praying to him when we find ourselves in a jam. Do not, uh, on the whole, God does not act. He's just kind of there. As for our lives, what we make of them, what our fortunes and destiny, all of that depends on us, our genes, our environment. Those are the determining factors of our lives, not God. It's a wonder that God then makes these declarations of his coming judgment and wrath. It's no wonder he makes these declarations. We're no different today from the people of Judah, the people that Zephaniah was talking to. And God help us. Because he wasn't just speaking to Judah. God's judgment was and still is to come. So remnant, as Kirk said, it's not really a a word that we hear commonly used anymore and perhaps most frequently just those little scraps of fabric left over pieces. That's how I think of remnant, the leftovers. But more precisely, that word means the remainder, what remains remnant. We can kind of hear remain in that word. But what remains after total destruction? Despite his prophecy, Zephaniah is not without hope. Because in the midst of all that doom and gloom and total destruction, Zephaniah speaks that word, remnant. Ah, remnant, that's a clue. There will be something that remains. There will be a remnant. The remnant are those who trust in the Lord. They will remain after the destruction. The coming destruction will not be total annihilation. A remnant, the faithful to the Lord, will remain. And on that day, there will be joy, even singing. God himself will sing for joy, for his faithful children will remain. Jesus, too, spoke of that coming day, the day of judgment, the day when he will come again, and this time there will be a new creation. The old creation will be gone. And he will make all things new. And Jesus himself is the one who will restore the remnant, the remaining faithful ones. Of that day, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Now, friends, about the times and dates, we don't need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 
While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are the sons of light and the sons of the day. We do not belong in the darkness. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming again, and his kingdom and the remnant will be restored. That's the day Zephaniah is pointing to. So maybe the day of the Lord's coming isn't on our radar. Maybe you don't have it marked out on your calendar. But Jesus is coming. His coming is nearer now than it ever has been before. So let's not grow tired or weary. Instead, let's busy ourselves, not looking up in the sky, waiting, but doing what he told us to do. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to God with our prayers, um, we want to remember that we've been praying this week for Mike and Julia, Julie, sorry, Darla, Victoria, and Fred, and Dylan. Are there others that we could be praying for this morning that you would like us to be praying for? It's also a time if you've been listening online to maybe just put simple comments and uh, we could add those to the prayer uh, team's list as well. Are there things, we other things, Jenny? Okay, so for Bill and upcoming treatments. Are there other things that we could be praying for, Janice? So for Cease, as he sees the uh, oncologist tomorrow. Other things that we can be praying for? Other things? Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Sorry, did I see another one? Sorry. Oh, Allison, sorry about that. Okay, Janice. Janice, and uh, cornea transplant. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. God, your beauty is everywhere as we were made aware yesterday, not just in cleaning up and replanting but also in the beauty of being together. For the beauty that many will see tonight in the lunar eclipse for the reminder that, again, you are in control of the things that are often out of our control and, yes, even in control of the things that we are desperately holding on to 
that we believe we are guiding and we are directing. But your plans are much bigger than our plans, O oh God. And even though you are a great and glorious God, a God who sits on a throne having cherubim and seraphim sing to him constantly over and over again. Yet you are a gentle God, a God who is aware of everything that is going on, every small and insignificant detail that you are aware of, of our needs and of our concerns, of those things that are weighing heavy upon us for those individuals, Mike and Julie, Darla, Victoria, Fred, Dylan, Bill, Cease, and Janice. But you are also concerned about those that have been mentioned in the comment sections or those in our own hearts and minds this day, those faces and names and situations that maybe are just too difficult to say. But yet you love to hear our voices. You love to know that, that we need you, that your church needs you, that governments need you, that nations need you, that our world needs you. And as we see what is happening in our world today, we, we say, as Allison reminded us, you, you are coming quickly. So we wait. And in the meantime, we become your hands and feet doing your work, but we also become your ears as we listen to one another and those who long to be heard. That we become the voice of the voiceless. That when the world says God is nowhere to be seen, we are able to display God. So may we do that even in our small congregation. That as we leave this place, that worship would not end at 1130, but that our worship would continue on Monday morning as we go to work, as we raise our children, as we face difficult situations, as some struggle to make ends meet with the rising costs and prices, as some are feeling lonely or in desperate need, who feel forgotten and alone, may we, may we be your church this week. Empower us, we pray. Thank you that you hear us when we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. Our closing song is Even So Come, that we invite you to join us uh, following our benediction. We're just going to stay for a few moments. We can catch up as we get things set up again. Um, we really encourage you to stay. We need your voice and for your discernment. Um, so we invite you to stay and then um, following um, a couple of the items that we're going to discuss and then Jeff Loach is coming from Nobleton and will guide us for the last um, bit of information. And again, if you're watching online and you don't have the link, just email me and I can send you the link to join in on Zoom. So let's continue our worship as we sing together.
Let's stand together. to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us 
faultless before his glorious throne. May be all wisdom and power, honor and glory now and forever. Thank you.